Okay, let me begin while we're working on that. Um, so last week, we uh, introduced uh, the uh, uh, question uh, or, or the genre of science fiction and the way that science fiction has been an instrumentality, a kind of imaginative landscape <laughs> for uh, dealing uh, with uh, issues that uh, arise in our society uh, a, uh, or uh, more generally an imaginative landscape that makes use of uh, the dominant mode of uh, um, uh, really validity in our society, uh, which is of course science. And so it, uh, it is a, a, a kind of fiction that draws on our prevailing concepts of truth. And we also then talked about uh, the problem that's confronting us, the problem of climate change. Uh, and so uh, now uh, the uh, uh, rest of the course will be talking about how the genre of science fiction has confronted and uh, thought about and given us some tools for thinking about this topic. Now what I want to do today uh, is <laughs> <laughs> is to begin uh, by talking about uh, some science fiction classics that were written before uh, climate change became an issue. Uh, basically in the 1980s was the time when people first became aware of the issue of climate change, the idea that we were uh, through uh, human intervention in the way I described at the end of last session through the burning of fossil fuels that uh, we were uh, influencing uh, uh, the climate uh, in a way that might have potentially dangerous consequences. Uh, prior to the 1980s, that was not a prevailing view. We don't have it yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, that was not a prevailing view. And uh, you might wonder, well, uh, since uh, science fiction writers uh, deal with the future and deal with prediction and uh, um, uh, see themselves as being prescient, uh, did they anticipate it? And the answer is no. Uh, this is not exactly surprising. The future is extremely hard to uh, predict. Uh, there are um, a number of uh, interesting uh, lapses in uh, science fiction. Uh, there is really no a science fiction book that pre uh, predicted the internet. Now, once it became a possibility, uh, science fiction writers uh, became quite um, enthusiastic about depicting it and did so in very interesting uh, ways. The term avatar, for example, as used for a net presence, uh, it's a term from Indian religion, but is used as a net presence, comes from a classic science fiction book, um, uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, Snow Crash, and so, which I'll have uh, by referring to a few other times in this uh, course, although it's uh, not technically a, a, a book about climate. But um, the, uh, the other predictions uh, uh, that also, uh, I mean, you know, you see things uh, like uh, people talking about space travel uh, and the, the radio that the people are using has vacuum tubes. And, you know, it's sort of understandable that you can't really imagine uh, everything. Well, one of the other gaps in science fiction is social. So, for example, uh, uh, Star Surgeon, a book about um, set, I don't know, several thousand years in the future that depicts a hospital on the edge of the galaxy dealing with an intergalactic war, has a great deal of very advanced technology. However, and this was written in, in the um, 1950s, all the doctors are men and all the nurses are women. Uh, the idea that a, do a woman might be a doctor was beyond the conception of, uh, this, uh, um, uh, of, of this book, despite all its uh, 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 technological uh, advancement. So some things get predicted and some things uh, are not. And climate change uh, was not one of those things that was predicted. What's interesting, though, is that you had a number of books in the 50, uh, 50s and 60s that uh, dealt with the issues that climate change 
presents and did it in very interesting ways. And those are the books that I want to talk about uh, today. Before that, On the way to get we're, uh, we're close to getting it. Okay. What I wanted to do, and I'll take a chance of starting in the hope that I won't <laughs> hex the computer here, um, is talk a little bit about a general issue, which is uh, our society's approach to and understanding of nature, of what we now call the environment, although uh, that is itself a modern term and uh, reveals modern notions about the way we conceive things. But uh, going back, uh, historically, uh, the usual term was nature. Do we have it? We're close. OK. OK, that, well, that, that looks good. It's not flickering. OK. Well, all right, let, 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 me, let, me, let me start. So <laughs> I won't talk about the very complex attitudes that people had about nature during Greco-Roman times. And uh, in some sense, we all um, are influenced uh, by those uh, very important ideas. So let me start uh, with our own society. Um, our, uh, there's some question, <laughs> some question about what it means to say our own society. Traditionally, uh, it be, was dated from the fall of Rome. Uh, from the year 476, when the last Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Romulus Augustus was di um, uh, displaced by a, a barbarian king who didn't claim the uh, <laughs> okay, uh, who didn't claim the uh, uh, the title uh, of emperor. His name was Odoacer, and uh, um, the period that followed was <laughs> called the uh, Dark Ages. This is now disparaged by historians, partially because it seems like a, um, just an insulting term, and it doesn't tell us very much. Uh, but also, there's been a shift to thinking of the transition period as somewhat later. That is to say, the notion is that that period is now called, uh, at least through the 8th century, late antiquity. So if we begin with the 9th century, and at this point, any chance that we're going to get it? We're close. We're close. <laughs> Okay. And when that line reaches the end? Uh, okay. Uh, during the uh, period that followed late antiquity, the so called, um, you know, that was the uh, uh, early Middle Ages, people's <coughs> attitude toward nature was that it represented a threat, that it was a dangerous place. And specifically, uh, because we're now in an era that where um, Christianity uh, was the uh, predominant uh, worldview through which people understood not only their relationship to God, but uh, as I mentioned the last time, that this was a comprehensive system of explanation by which they understood you know, how the star, what the stars were, how the um, uh, sun moved around the earth, and all these other things. And so uh, from that perspective, they understood the risks of nature as being a situation where uh, the world was filled with demons. The world was uh, a threatening place. Uh, there were uh, demons in the forest. There were demons in the caves. There were demons in the air. The, 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 uh, when you got high enough, you were in heaven, and that was good. Uh, but between... Uh, let's say one story high or two stories high building and heaven was a region of air filled by demons. Uh, the only safe thing to penetrate that was a church steeple. Uh, and <laughs> so that's, that, that, those were the uh, only tall buildings that were being built at the time. So uh, there was this notion of nature as a threatening danger. And you, you know, you can see uh, the logic behind this. It came not only from certain aspects of the Christian religion, but also from the fact that if you're a subsistence farmer living with pretty primitive agriculture and no uh, modern medicine, nature is a pretty dangerous place. It can and does a lot, uh, uh, a lot of very bad things to you. The 
the shift. <laughs> Are we close? I don't know what. I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Here, you don't want to use my computer? How big is that pile? Well, it's. 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 it's okay. Okay, I will. What I was going. Have this online, do you anyway? Yes, I do. Oh, you do. It's online. Okay, let's try that. Then. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think that would be. Okay, if, if you want me to, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cancel that one more time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Put me. Uh, yeah. How do I get? How do I um, access? My okay. Open Google Chrome will do it. Okay. Um, so I want. Is it Vanderbilt.edu? Yes. Yeah. There you go. Okay. 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 Welcome to lecture two, the beginnings of Cli-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The shift uh, in attitudes toward nature in the Western world is often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Now, uh, our current pope, when he chose the name Francis, it, it was never used uh, as a, a, a regnal name before, partially because it's a nickname. That wasn't his name. Franc uh, Francis means Frenchy uh, because of his family's business connections to France. Uh, his name was, I think, Giuseppe. But in any event, so uh, the modern pope chose Francis uh, as his name. And many people said, well, uh, this is a connection to or a reference to the fact that he's concerned about the poor. And of course, St. Francis was uh, uh, famous for ministering to the poor. Indeed, the first um, member of, uh, the, uh, of a regular order who went out and ministered to the poor. The Franciscans were the first of the uh, 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 preaching orders, monastic orders, to do that. But uh, it was interesting that it was also this pope who came out with an encyclical about uh, global warming, uh, because St. Francis is also famous for his reverence to nature. And his view, uh, his idea was, well, if God created man, uncontroversial in the Middle Ages, to be sure, and God created the rest of the world, equally uncontroversial, then the rest of uh, the world are our brothers and sisters. And his most famous um, uh, prayer that he wrote is called the Canticle of the Creatures, which begins, Brother, Son, and Sister Moon. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I have one already. You need two. Of them. I need two. Okay. Yep. Okay. I feel like the bionic man now. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one of the famous incidents uh, was uh, that uh, St. Francis got out of his um, um, uh, a wagon or something and went to preach to the birds because the birds are God's creatures and so they should hear. Uh, the good news about uh, Jesus' salvation as well. And y this is um, a painting possibly by Giotto, we're not entirely certain, but it's in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. Uh, and it exists today uh, along with a magnificent uh, sequence of frescoes uh, depicting uh, Francis' life. Uh, you can see the astonishment of the uh, more conventional uh, monk behind St. Francis as he um, preaches uh, to the birds. But this is a kind of indication of Francis's reverence for nature, his feeling of benevolence, his feeling of welcoming toward nature. Now, obviously, uh, there were other people who were uh, thinking similarly at the time, but Francis certainly uh, crystallized that view and began a process of rethinking uh, in the Western world our relationship to nature. Uh, so, uh, this, this is Giotto again. This is Giotto for sure, on the left, uh, uh, 1310. This is the so-called Agnesanti uh, Madonna. It uh, was originally in the Church of Agnesanti, which you can still see. Uh, in Florence, the painting itself has been transferred to the Uffizi. But uh, there he is, uh, there is uh, the Madonna, and uh, uh, the, the rendering of the Madonna is actually quite advanced for the time. You can see that she has real volume and fills space. But the background uh, is 
uh, the gold of heaven. In other words, uh, there's a notion of separation from nature. Nature is not a part of any kind of a reverential vision. Uh, to the right, uh, two centuries later, uh, uh, Giovanni Bellini's Madonna with Child, uh, currently in the Borghese Gallery, and you can see the difference. The scene opens up on a beautifully rendered naturalistic scene, including, you may, uh, you may be able to see, two little peasants winding their way along, uh, along the road. But the idea of uh, nature being part of a reverential uh, depiction uh, is one that's developing at this time. And it, 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 it goes uh, along with this kind of attention to nature. Here's a um, obviously uh, uh, predominantly religiously themed uh, painting. It's also uh, a painting that uh, deals with human emotion very uh, directly. You can see the figures there very much uh, Renaissance uh, art in, in, in the expressiveness. But you can also see, as you look into the background, that same sensitivity to natural scenery, that same notion that nature is an essential part of uh, a, 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 a religious depiction. That this is not taking place in heaven, this is taking place on earth, on our earth. Uh, this is also a religious painting. It's a little later. It's by uh, 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 Patinier. Uh, this, this painting happens to be in the Hermitage, where you can see it. Uh, and uh, the religious theme is uh, the rest on the flight into Egypt, which was a very standard thing to paint at this time. Uh, but you'll have to look for a moment before you see why it's a rest on the flight into uh, Egypt. And there in the foreground are some tiny little figures that look perfectly ordinary and uh, have no, uh, I mean, anyone seeing this at the time would know what it was, but don't have, seem to have any particular religious feeling uh, toward them. I mean, there, there are interpretations of this painting that would uh, uh, identify some of the iconography as religious, but it's hard not to look at the painting and see this as a painting of landscape, as a painting of nature. Uh, regardless of whether or not there's symbolism here, nature is rendered in uh, loving uh, detail and is in many ways the point of the painting. It's certainly not the depiction of the, uh, of the human figure. By the 19th century, uh, we have a, a, a shift uh, represented by the Romantic movement where nature is not only something that we feel reverential to, but something that uh, uh, we have a kind of um, kind of an, um, an admiration mixed with awe about something akin to the feeling people were supposed to have to, toward God in an earlier period. That's Courbet. Uh, this is a very famous picture. He painted a number of uh, uh, leading French intellectuals. Proudhon is there. Georges Sand. Uh, is there a number of other figures are there uh, in his studio, but you can see he's turning away from the classical nude and uh, painting his beloved landscape. He, he has no, I mean, he did, he did plenty of um, human figures, but he's picturing himself here as having very little interest uh, in, in the human figure. What he's interested in is landscape, and he was, in fact, a brilliant landscape painter. You can see here, uh, nature is large, it's overwhelming. The small buildings uh, uh, cluster at the bottom of the cliff, and uh, what's, uh, the cliff itself is dramatic. Uh, this painting, by the, uh, th this painting uh, is in the uh, uh, Dorsey uh, Museum uh, in uh, Paris, where you can see it. Uh, uh, this, uh, I mentioned that's in the Hermitage. Uh, this one is also in the Dorsey. This one, I don't know. I think it's in a private collection, actually, unfortunately. But this is uh, uh, The Wave, a famous painting by uh, Courbet, showing nature in its dramatic, in its uh, sub sublime would have been the term at the time, and its uh, kind of overwhelming guise. So now we have uh, a shift, in a way, from benevolence to a kind of admiration, a kind of awe with which we approach uh, nature. Uh, this is another classic romantic uh, painting, Casper uh, 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 Friedrich's uh, Wanderer. 
Uh, this is in the Art Museum in uh, Hamburg, as is this. This is a, a link to our theme. So um, uh, this is a magnificent painting of the Arctic uh, and uh, at the time when it was still all frozen. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but again, you can see uh, the feeling toward, uh, toward nature. Bierstadt uh, was a European who came to the United States and painted uh, American scenery. And he painted it with the same sense of awe and mysticism and reverence and drama. Uh, uh, the figures, as in Courbet's, are tiny little figures set at the base of a uh, spectacular, overwhelming natural scene. Uh, this, is, uh, this painting of Puget Sound, appropriately enough, it's in the Seattle uh, Museum of Art. And this is a painting of the Ro Rocky Mountains. And I guess less inappropriately, it's in the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, but, <laughs> but there again, you see uh, that same uh, kind of uh, effect. And this was the meaning of the new world for many people. I mean, that's what uh, Europeans, when they thought about the new world, I mean, there were a number of uh, issues that uh, were present for them, uh, but certainly one of them. Uh, now, uh, in recent years, we've had another shift. We've become aware, and this predates glob uh, the recognition of global warming, we've become aware of a different aspect of nature. And this is another, uh, I don't want to say global shift, this is another major, or uh, uh, let's say a sea change, uh, uh, in uh, our view of nature. Nature is fragile. Nature is delicate. Nature is something that we need to protect. All of a sudden, we've become aware that our efforts to uh, control and conquer uh, nature have gone so far that uh, we're, uh, uh, we're actually uh, not only controlling it, but potentially uh, destroying it. So this was a fairly early recognition of that fact. Obviously, Dr. Seuss is a children's writer. And for the most part, he writes uh, fanciful children's books with uh, uh, you know, little uh, uh, implicit messages like, be yourself, you know, Horton hatches the egg. Uh, or um, uh, you know, uh, don't uh, go looking uh, for a perfect world. You won't find it. I had trouble getting to Salah Salu. But in this book, he's quite explicit about the, de uh, it's about deforestation, but the damage that we're doing to nature. And of course, the most influential force on the way people think uh, is uh, the Disney studio. And they have uh, also adopted this view very, very strongly. And you, you could almost see this as a declaration of a new approach to nature. These movies are extremely influential because everybody growing up uh, in uh, this uh, uh, generation, growing up in the um, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, was uh, watching them. But these uh, two movies in particular are, have very strong uh, messages about how we need to protect nature, how we, can, uh, how we have the potential uh, to, uh, uh, to destroy it. And this has led, to, obviously, to the environmental movement, the Sea Shepherd, uh, you may be familiar with from the television uh, show, has been aggressively trying to protect whales from the whaling industry. Uh, that's one of the Sea Shepherd uh, vessels actually ramming a, uh, a whaling ship, which they've done uh, from uh, time to time. A somewhat more ironic approach, the World Wildlife Fund uh, has adopted uh, the panda as its mascot, uh, obviously a um, highly endangered endangered animal as well as an unbelievably cute one. And uh, uh, so uh, the message here, uh, uh, you know, obviously from the, the whole image is of a, uh, of a delicate creature who's feeling sorrowful about what's been done to its environment. But they've gone to the point of even taking things that were previously regarded as fierce and dangerous and uh, making them objects of sympathy. Uh, as, as well, and quite properly, all these, um, well, well uh, two of them are highly endangered, and even elephants are uh, at, at risk in, in the wild. And so uh, they're making uh, the point by, uh, in, this, uh, in this poster. OK. So this brings us to uh, the uh, science fiction novels that <clears throat> I wanted to talk about in terms of 
uh, the uh, way that this body of literature has confronted and dealt with nature, which is the, the, uh, the theme I, I want to focus on uh, today. There are plenty of other things to be said about uh, the books we'll uh, uh, talk about. Uh, and uh, they raise a number of interesting issues. But the, uh, uh, the ones that are relevant to this course are uh, their attitude toward nature and what they have to say about uh, human interaction uh, with the natural world. As I said, they're, they all predate uh, global warming, and so they don't deal directly with the issue. But uh, they not only uh, address things that are relevant to the issues, but they do so uh, in extremely uh, interesting uh, ways. Um, I'm actually going to talk. This is uh, a slightly earlier version of uh, the uh, PowerPoint I was going to use. So the drowned world and then space merchants. Those will be the first uh, two. Uh, the drowned world deals with global warming, and space merchants deals with human impact on the environment. But neither book combines the two, which is to say uh, the global warming in the drowned world is not a result of human uh, in, uh, uh, interaction or, or intervention. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon. And uh, The Space Merchants, as far as I know, is the first um, dystopian novel to deal with resource depletion. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it does not uh, talk about warming as being one of the problems of resource, uh, <coughs> of what we've done to the environment. So there are two books that each raise uh, very uh, themes that are directly relevant to uh, the question of global warming, uh, but uh, neither of them are dealing with it per se. In the, drown uh, in the Drowned World, uh, written by British uh, novelist uh, J.G. Ballard, uh, and uh, 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 published in 1962, the same year as Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Uh, in the drowned world, there has been an ecological uh, disaster, but it's caused by uh, an increase in solar radiation. This is not uh, explained in great detail, but it's, there's enough detail so that it's regarded as quote unquote hard sci-fi, which is to say science fiction that attempts to come up with a plausible explanation for the changes that it's um, ex explaining as opposed, there's, I don't think there's really a term soft sci-fi, uh, but as opposed to the science fiction, which is um, more fanciful and blends into fantasy as we talked about last time. So uh, there's been solar flares and these have done two things. And this is interesting in terms of what we now know about global warming. It has melted uh, the polar ice caps uh, and so increased the sea level. Ballard knew enough to know that this alone wouldn't cause as much flooding as he wanted to depict. So what he also uh, assumes is that this warming effect has not only melted all the glaciers but all the permafrost, with the result that there have been enormous flows of silt into the oceans, decreasing the ocean size from two-thirds of the uh, Earth's surface, which I think is what it is now, to half, as he describes it, half the Earth's surface, and creating a world that is uh, basically a very low-lying, marshy area uh, uh, covered by uh, a, uh, uh, where those marshy areas are covered by uh, a thin layer of water. So they're essentially uh, tropical lagoons. It's very hot. Uh, uh, tropical foliage has uh, grown everywhere uh, on, uh, uh, over this world. Certainly, well, uh, the, the, the equatorial regions are uninhabited, he tells us. But the, um, North America and Europe are, have been turned into basically a gigantic tropical swamp. Uh, and uh, the uh, action in the book takes place in what used to be London, which is now a big lagoon. Uh, so this is uh, his account of what's happened in the world. Uh, and the action in the book involves a scientific expedition 
that's been uh, s uh, exploring these changes in the environment, has been documenting uh, the flora and, flora and fauna of this uh, new uh, drowned world. Uh, so uh, there's a military expedition coming down from the North Pole. The two remaining areas of the world that are truly habitable are the poles. And the population, such as remains, has retreated to the poles. Uh, in any event, there's a scientific ex expedition exploring the flora and fauna of uh, what used to be London. And uh, they've done so by towing a big laboratory on a boat into the London lagoon uh, to carry out these experiments. When the, uh, the, the main character is uh, the one of the scientists who's in charge of uh, this uh, uh, floating la uh, laboratory. His name is Robert Karens. Uh, and uh, uh, there's another uh, scientist he works with, Alan Bodkin. Uh, these are two of the main characters in, in uh, wow. Uh, I don't need it really anymore, but, um, uh, oh, okay, it's, it, that, it's fine. I wanted it for the art. I, you know, um, I can, I, I'll show the, okay. uh, but they, um, uh, so these two scientists uh, have been working on uh, documenting this under the um, <coughs> aegis of a military expedition headed by a uh, Colonel Riggs. When the action in the book starts, uh, Riggs has just gotten a notification that the mission is being withdrawn. That is to say, uh, you've done what you can do. The suggestion is you haven't done very much. They haven't figured out much. But you've done what you can do. Uh, tow, uh, uh, you know, go back to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Arctic, uh, tow the uh, laboratory back, and uh, end the mission. It turns out, and we see this immediately, that Karens doesn't want to leave. Now, he doesn't say this immediately. It's always assumed he's going to leave. Uh, how, how would he survive in, 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 in this um, uh, brutally hot, um, now undeveloped, unfarmable region? Uh, the, uh, the, the water level is such that the tall buildings rise up above it so you can live there. He's living in the uh, penthouse of a hotel. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no ground. There's, it's just water. It's just uh, a, a lagoon. And so it's not really habitable. Uh, but it turns out that he doesn't want to leave, and neither does his associate, Alan Bodkin. They stay. The third person who remains behind in this drowned world uh, is a woman whom Karens is having an affair with, uh, named Beatrice Dahl. Uh, she uh, is living in, the, uh, in a fabulously wealthy penthouse that rises up above uh, the waters. And uh, she is the granddaughter of a very wealthy man who owned this penthouse. She also doesn't want to leave. We're, we're, never, we're not told exactly why these three people are, uh, uh, desire to stay, and it originally causes some astonishment on the part of uh, Colonel Riggs. In fact, they have to make an effort to avoid him because his tendency is to say, don't you know what's uh, best you know, in your own good, particularly uh, Bodkin and uh, Karens, who's he's, who's he's in, who he is in charge of. But they stay. And they stay out of some kind of underlying fascination. The other person who stayed is the helicopter pilot from the mission, uh, whose name is Hardman, and he has just escaped. He's simply run away and uh, has, uh, uh, has started walking, moving south of London into the, into the increasingly um, heated interior. They actually send a rescue mission after him. They find him, but he fights his way free and disappears into the swamps. So we have a situation where uh, the, this um, brutally hot, uh, overgrown, tr uh, tropical environment is exercising some kind of fascination, some kind of draw on these uh, four characters, including uh, the three characters, uh, Karen's Bodkin and um, uh, uh, 
uh, Beatrice, who are the main characters uh, in, in, in the book. And we get an, um, an indication fairly early on of what's going on with these three characters. Botkin and um, Beatrice have been having dreams. They've been having very vivid dreams, and their dreams involve um, a, uh, visions of a primordial world inhabited by dinosaurs or other kinds of um, extinct uh, creatures, uh, by carboniferous forests. And you get a sense after a while that this is what the author is, uh, one of the things the author is, is, is getting at here. Uh, what he seems to be saying is that there's some kind of primordial instinct bred into us, it's a kind of ontogeny reproduces phylogeny notion, bred into us that is a kind of biological memory, almost deep down in our mitochondria or our spinal cord or whatever, of the history of the world. And it's exercising a, um, a kind of draw on people, both mentally and subconsciously. So Karen's at first is not aware uh, is that, uh, he's having dreams, or maybe he's not having dreams, but he begins having dreams after uh, the, uh, the action in the book uh, starts. And those dreams are described in, uh, it, it's okay now, I'll just uh, re reactivate it if I need it. Uh, those dreams are, are, are described uh, with uh, uh, some interesting and, uh, and, and, and vivid uh, 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 language. Now, uh, after the military leaves, for a while, these three people are living alone in this world and dealing with its impact on them. Uh, the book proceeds with the arrival of a kind of a scavenger or a pirate uh, named Strangman. And he comes with a group of sort of thugs, although he himself is a uh, clearly an educated and intelligent uh, person. At first, he has a friendly relationship with uh, these three people. I mean, he's, he's there for some pr scavenging purposes that's not uh, fully uh, explained at, at the time, but he has a friendly relationship with these people. Um, he's, you know, like them, they're intelligent and they can sit around and talk about either practical practicalities. I mean, uh, both uh, Bodkin and Karens are, uh, experienced scientists, or uh, what, this, uh, what, the, what the events uh, mean, uh, and in fact engages in a kind of a uh, uh, um, enterprise with uh, the two of them, and specifically with Karens, of exploring a planetarium. The planetarium, being a low building, is entirely underwater, and so Karens goes down as a diver to uh, explore uh, the planetarium on his behalf. Uh, and uh, this, is no, this is not an entirely subtle book. So let me just read a little uh, section from this so you get a feeling of what he's um, after. He's, uh, Karens is now underwater in his scuba gear, gear and he's, he's swam into the planetarium dome. As the spotlight flared across the domed ceiling, illuminating the huge vacant womb for the last time, Karens felt the warm, blood-filled nausea of the chamber flood in upon him. He lay back, spread-eagled on the steps, his hand pressed numbly against the loop of line around the door handle, the soothing pressure of the water penetrating his suit so the barriers between his own private bloodstream and that of the giant amnion seemed no longer to exist. The deep cradle of silt carried him gently like an immense placenta, infinitely softer than any bed he had ever known. So you can see what's happening here. Uh, he's been essentially um, enwrapped by something that's so powerful that he can't escape from. In fact, he almost dies. He has to be, he makes no effort to swim out or rescue himself as his oxygen fails, and he has to be pulled out by Strangman. Uh, so there's this notion of primordial times and our primordial experience as organisms who begin in the womb, which is this wet tropical place, right? And 
uh, what Ballard uh, is talking about is some kind of reversion of both individuals and the Earth as a totality. Now, just to finish uh, the, um, the action uh, for you, uh, after a while, uh, there's a falling out between uh, Strangman and um, uh, Bodkin and uh, 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 Karens and, and, and Beatrice. And what the cause of it is that it turns out, here's what Strangman is there to do, and he does it. He does it, in fact, as he gets weirder and weirder uh, uh, as the time goes on. He does it, in, in effect, at a party. And he invites them to, uh, the, the scientists to go out and, and look at the lagoon. And as they look at the lagoon, they see the water level lowering. It turns out that he's dammed up the sides of the lagoon and by the use of powerful pumps has drained the water out of it. Now, uh, obviously he's doing this for the purpose of seeing what he can scavenge. But uh, you might think, well, you know, this is sort of beneficial. I mean, if he's drained the water out of this lagoon and created a uh, barrier around, uh, uh, around it, well, maybe we can live in it again. Maybe we can start farming it. The scientists, and this is not explained, the scientists both react with extreme hostility uh, toward what he's done. What he's done is a, um, uh, regarded as some kind of a hara, some kind of an abuse to them. Bodkin tries to blow up the dam so that the water will rush back in. Um, Strangman runs, a, uh, runs after him, diffuses the explosive, and shoots him. At that point, uh, Strangman, uh, I think, assumes that Karens is in cahoots with him and uh, uh, ties Karens up uh, and starts torturing him. And uh, he doesn't have the nerve to kill him because he knows that uh, he's a military official, uh, but uh, he starts torturing him and does so in the midst of this wild orgiastic party that uh, he and his followers are having uh, in this now uh, drained uh, space. He's also uh, imprisoned uh, Beatrice up in her, uh, in her penthouse. In any event, after some, uh, 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 some uh, other events, uh, Karens manages to escape. He goes to Beatrice. He takes Beatrice and they try to get away. They're stopped by Strangman, who's now ready to kill them, when all of a sudden the cavalry appears, Colonel Riggs is back, uh, with, um, uh, with the military and uh, rescues um, uh, um, Karens and uh, Beatrice. He does not punish Riggs, despite, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, he does not punish Strangman, despite uh, Karen's request that he do so. He says, Strangman hasn't done anything wrong. I mean, he shot Bodkin, but he shot Bodkin because Bodkin was trying to blow up his property, in effect. So uh, there's nothing to punish. What has he done wrong? Karen's, and again, we're not told exactly why, assumes that he has done something wrong. Exactly why, uh, we don't know. Well, I'm, I'm, let's see running out of time, so I, I won't read it. But essentially, he blows up the dam. There's a wonderful description of the water rising up and inundating this uh, space again. Uh, then he escapes to the south, down toward the area of greater uh, increasing heat. He runs into Hardman, who's now pretty uh, debilitated, helps him out a little, and then heads further into uh, the, um, uh, the tropical jungle, and it ends with the phrase um, uh, that he is a second Adam searching for the got forgotten paradises of the reborn son. So now, uh, to some extent, the lack of motivation of the characters is simply a feature of uh, science fiction genre. At least at this time, this was not a literature of character. This is a literature of ideas and plot. And mo very often you get the feeling that the characters are just devices to advance the plot and to engage the reader with a person as the plot advances. And I would say that's true of uh, uh, pretty much all the books we're going to be talking about in this early phase. It is not true of the more recent literature that, um, that we'll uh, talk about later on, like Atwood's Mar uh, Oryx and Crake. But it is true of this. Nonetheless, uh, as a kind of a regard for, the, uh, for 
uh, the author, you have to ask, well, what is going on with these characters? Why do they uh, have this reaction? And one of the things that this book gets at, I think, and one of the things Ballard is get, getting at, uh, is this notion of, a, uh, of nature having been something we wronged. And so nature is turning on us. And it's taking us back to a pre-civilized time. And there's something in us that responds to that, something in us that is wrong about what has been done to the world, to urbanization, to industrial development, something that is so powerfully um, disconnected from our own feelings that in a situation like this, characters might opt to go back to this primeval world. There's an explicit notion of this as being um, a uh, time of, let's say, 200 million years ago. They mentioned the Triassic uh, era. He is correct, his science is correct in saying that the world was much, much warmer at the time of uh, uh, the, di the, the dinosaurs. And so, you know, it's not clear that you couldn't live in this world. I mean, the temperature is very high, but there's an implication that maybe we could adjust to it in a new kind of existence. And that maybe the future of humankind, if there is to be a future, and maybe there isn't on this new planet, uh, but maybe the uh, future of humankind is going to be a, uh, a more primeval, different future, a, a different turn. Uh, this goes back to uh, one of the uh, great ideas of modern times, which is Jean-Jacques Rousseau's notion that civilization represented a horrible wrong turn. And you can see how that reflects that uh, he's considered a proto-romantic. That romantic view of nature as something grand, something not, not only um, to be revered, but something that is uh, to be held in awe. And so the theme here, which is, which is an interesting one, and it's depicted through global warming, is that the world has turned on us. And this is significant because if you think about uh, the actual situation, the actual political situation, the science of uh, global warming, uh, we have, you know, we've been uh, sort of controlling nature for a long, a long time. Uh, our dominance of nature is now greater than it's ever been before. Nature is a fragile thing, as Dr. Seuss and Rachel Carson and uh, Walt Disney and so many other, and the World Wildlife Fund and so many other people are pointing out. But it's also turned on us. Its fragility has become a threat. So it's not just something like the panda that you can feel sorry for. If the panda becomes extinct, right, that will be really sad and zoos will be much less fun to go to. But our material existence, human life, will not be threatened. And so you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, Jim Inhofe or um, Donald Trump saying, who cares about the panda? Who needs the panda? What good is a bear, uh, as, um, uh, uh, as someone uh, said. But the very fragility of the environment has become a source of tremendous threat, a danger to our lifestyle, a danger to uh, our prosperity, a danger uh, to, uh, to our future. And so there's that um, curious reversal as, as we become first more benevolent, feeling more benevolent and then more um, reverential to nature and then uh, uh, more uh, concerned about it and uh, more protective of it, it's all of a sudden turned against us and it's become what it was for people in the early Middle Ages a threat, uh, a <coughs> danger, a, uh, something that looms over us, something that uh, can uh, destroy our lives, not at this point by being filled with demons or being more powerful, but being fragile and being subject to the wrong that we've done to it. And Ballard, interestingly, without um, writing a book about the human intervention in nature, ha gets, gets to this. He gets to this in a, in a, through a different path. Okay, uh, The Space Merchants, uh, which, well, 
Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, the, the space merchants. Uh, Old-fashioned audiovisual aid um, uh, is a very interesting book. I would uh, recommend uh, this one uh, to you. It is also not an artful piece of fiction. Uh, it uh, is th th the characters are uh, somewhat thin. The main character had the potential of being a very interesting character, but uh, the author doesn't uh, follow through. They, he, ha he has a change in. Uh, view that I'll describe in a moment, but it's not motivated the way it would be in a more artful piece of work. That is to say, uh, we don't get an understanding of what was behind his changed point of view. It's just, pre it's just uh, presented as a, uh, a plot device. It ends uh, with a series of reversals and counter-reversals that you're all familiar with uh, from uh, uh, action movies, uh, you know, like um, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the uh, Tom Cruise movies and uh, uh, things, uh, 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 vari various kinds of movies about conspiracies and plots and things like that. So it ends li like that. But the opening vision of society and uh, the, uh, the way that he depicts it uh, has uh, been enormously influential and is very powerful, re remarkably so. This was written in 1952. And it really is the first book that talks about uh, resource depletion and how resource depletion might be the source of dystopia. The previous uh, books about dystopia tended to be political. They tended to depict the source of uh, the stress uh, or uh, the uh, uh, sort of negative utopia of the future as being as a result of political forces, of things that um, resulted from our failure to govern ourselves. So you have, of course, Brave New World in 1984. Both of those are uh, intensely political books and going back uh, to the f really the first um, uh, dystopian book, uh, uh, Zemiatin's uh, uh, We, uh, which is a satire on, uh, of uh, some of the uh, tendencies in communism, was written in, in er, very early uh, after the uh, Bolshevik revo Revolution, uh, very similar, p but entirely political. Uh, in this book, it's political, but the politics is somewhat different, and it's a theme uh, that has been sounded in a number of other science fiction books. So uh, politi uh, politics are no longer what's controlling the United States or the Western world. It's business. Uh, the president takes orders from private companies uh, and is regarded as a trivial, insignificant figure by the heads of those uh, companies. The world is basically privatized. That is to say, it's private organizations. This is done even more dramatically and extremely well in the first um, part of Neil Stevenson's uh, Snow Crash, which I mentioned, which is a, um, uh, a, a cyberpunk novel. Uh, but uh, begins with a wonderful picture of an entirely privatized Los Angeles where if you get um, in trouble, private police uh, who are paid by credit card arrest you and put you either in the lockup or the huskow. Those are two private organizations, the lockup and the huskow. If you have enough money, you go to the lockup. If you don't have money, you wind up in the huskow, which is a lot worse. Okay, so um, that's another book, by the way, that moves from a wonderful initial vision to a very confused um, uh, action sequence with a lot of reversals. And uh, by, by, uh, by the end of the book, I, I think it's something, uh, it, it becomes somewhat tiresome. Uh, and that's something that happens very often in this, in this genre. But the first third of Snow Crash, I would recommend to you. It's, it's very well written. And um, uh, the satire is, 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 is savage and to the point. But it, in a way, it's a lineal descendant of the space merchants, which is written much earlier. Now, this, the, the space merchants involves a, uh, a man named Mitch Courtney, Courtney, who's an advertising executive. He's, in fact, a star performer. He's a copywriter. And his great skill is to manipulate people, to come up with advertising schemes that 
uh, gets people to want the product that he's advertising for on the basis of a variety of totally uh, invalid um, uh, or irrelevant uh, features, like um, if you uh, wear uh, the clothing that um, he's advertising, which is uh, 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 then so the company's advertising, uh, uh, you will have sex appeal. Not an unfamiliar point uh, in advertising, of course, but that's the kind of campaigns that uh, he, he runs, and that's uh, why he's moved to the top of uh, his uh, ad ad advertising uh, firm. So uh, there he is uh, as a, uh, a star performer, and he's... <coughs> now been given, and this is how the action starts in the book, he's now been given a uh, very uh, valuable account, which is the Venus account. Uh, an astronaut has just come back from Venus. He was sent to Venus. He's, in fact, a 35-inch midget, who is the only person who could fit in the rocket that they had. He's been to Venus. He's come back from Venus. And uh, now the next step, having reached Venus, is to colonize and terraform Venus. And what they're doing is they're selling rights or, or selling opportunities to do this. Now, in fact, um, uh, as uh, O'Shea uh, tells Courtney at the very beginning, Venus is a horrible place. Uh, but uh, Courtney's interest, of course, is in selling it. And so the idea is how to make it a, um, a good place uh, 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 to live. Um, Courtney, uh, some of the rest of the action, I'm just wondering how much, uh, how much time I have to um, uh, dis dis describe this. Okay, but Courtney, um, uh, a lot of, uh, some of the action involves um, his ex-wife, whose name is uh, Kate, uh, who, uh, and this is an interesting theme, this is 1952, unlike uh, uh, Star Surgeon, uh, she's a doctor. And one of the reasons she's broken up with um, Courtney is that he's a male chauvinist. Those, that term isn't used, it didn't exist, but that's what, that's what she says, is that's why she's uh, broken up with him. She wants to live her own life. She points out to him that she's, after all, a doctor. Uh, we think there's something else going on. There are signals that there's something else going on at well, but that's the way it's presented. There is a terrorist group around called the CONSEES. This stands for conservationists. Um, when um, when um, Courtenay is returning from his interview with O'Shea at the early point of the book, there is an explosion caused by the Concies that almost kills him. And uh, he himself uh, is a little bewildered uh, by this, and he says, um, uh, who would want to shoot a simple, harmless advertising man like me? <laughs> he wonders. Um, and this is part of his general naivete, which is presented with a great deal of uh, satire in the book. The world of this book is a world of resource depletion. It's a world that doesn't have water. It's a world that doesn't have fuel. Uh, we learn this, and this is done very cleverly. Uh, we learn this when Courtenay, obviously a very rich man and you know, in the elite, um, has the advantage of being able to travel around the city by jumping into a rickshaw peddled by two people. Wow, that's a great way to travel, isn't it? Uh, that's because there's no oil left. So this is the way people are getting around in the city. In another scene, uh, he uh, climbs up. This is when later in the book when he's, um, uh, when he's involved in, in a, a kind of a, a struggle with somebody else. He has to climb stairs uh, of the, uh, an apartment. He climbs up uh, to the 85th floor. Um, uh, up through the first 50 floors, of course, the stairway is filled with people who are living there because there's no other space, no other indoor space besides these stairways. Once he gets above um, the 50th or the 80th floor, he's in the executive area, and then he can climb up the stairs because there are no more people in the stairs. So um, th the authors uh, present this world of uh, uh, ter uh, terrifically uh, uh, depleted resources in a, uh, in a subtle, clever, and very satirical way. And that's one of the uh, uh, fun things in the, in the book. Now, the central part of the action involves uh, Courtenay, after having fired uh, the subordinate of Matt Runstead 
in the Los Angeles office, going down to Antarctica to uh, explore uh, living under um, harsh conditions. Uh, and uh, Runstead appears as he's down there and whacks him over the head. He wakes up to find himself uh, in a uh, facility that's processing chicken. And he ha ha um, has lost his identity. This uh, identity theft is another interesting theme in this book. I don't know. Uh, uh, and, and it's modern style identity theft. All his papers have been uh, uh, destroyed. He's gotten a, a tattoo on his arm indicating that he's a worker. Uh, there's been an obituary published in the paper indicating that he's dead. He's been deprived entirely of his status. He is now from this very um, high-powered executive, the lowest of the low, uh, in this facility. The facility, as I said, manufactures chicken. And the way it manufactures chicken is that it feeds a two-ton glob of protoplasm known as chicken little, which is pure chicken meat. And then people come in each morning and slice pieces off this living and growing piece of protoplasm that's fed with algae and other materials and take it, uh, and take it to, um, uh, uh, to market. Uh, uh, in the process of doing this, he not only confronts Chicken Little, but he also becomes the subject himself <laughs> of the advertising campaigns that, uh, he, um, uh, that he's generated. So for example, everybody's drinking coffee -ist. Coffee iced is a product. This is coffee, but of course it's been laced with chemicals that makes you want more of that particular product and not the competing product, which he knows, of course, because he's been on the inside, but now he's subject to uh, this. In any event, uh, uh, he's in a very uh, uh, bad situation. He has no obvious way of escape until he begins to make contact with some people in this facility who seem to be consies. Okay? And uh, after a while, they begin to trust him. They realize that he has these skills uh, and that he's a very intelligent man. And so they take him to their secret hideout where they're planning a, um, a, a, a sort of attack on the society. The hideout, hideout is underneath Chicken Little. <laughs> so they go, they slide under this blob of protoplasm into a, a, in, into a, a set of rooms that are actually underneath <laughs> this, this monstrosity. Uh, and they plan various things and they realize how good he is. He ultimately gets sent uh, to, uh, back to New York in a subordinate position. Uh, he's able to retrieve his identity. He then gets captured by uh, the uh, opposing advertising industry, and there are a, a series of reversals. It turns out that, um, now, let me just read this, because this is where the authors stand, and it's an interesting statement. This is the Kanchi statement that is given to uh, Courtenay when he is first being recruited to, uh, in the Chicken Little uh, facility. Um, facts. Uh, the, uh, the CONCES, they're called WCA, is a secret organization persecuted by all the governments of the world. It believes that reckless exploitation of natural resources has created needless poverty and needless human misery. It believes that continued exploitation will mean the end of human life on Earth. It believes that this trend may be reversed if the people of Earth can be educated to the point where they will demand planning of population, reforestation, soil building, de-urbanization, and an end to the wasteful production of gadgets and proprietary foods for which there is no natural demand. Now you notice he doesn't say uh, uh, burning fossil fuels, but it is so easy to insert that into this statement. It is so easy to see this book as a really vivid warning about not just burning fossil fuels per se, but the entire approach to the world and the entire approach to nature that has in fact made us uh, so dependent on fossil fuels and so, uh, uh, and uh, as a result, having such an impact on, uh, on, on the in, in environment. Uh, I, I mentioned, you know, the average European uses half as much gasoline uh, energy as the average American because they're not driving uh, 10 miles to work in a pickup truck, right? 
so, or, or a Hummer. Uh, so, you know, th this critique is one that really emerges uh, from this book and the images in this book. The book, by the way, is uh, the origin of the term soy burger. It's the origin of the term R&B for research and development. And it may be the origin of a joke that I particularly like and has gone through a number of different forms. But uh, when Mitch is still in his naive um, mode and can't imagine why anyone would object to this uh, modern society, uh, he says, um, I'd been exposed to constant sentiment in my time, and the arguments had all come down to one thing. Nature's way of living was the right way of living. Silly. If nature had intended us to eat fresh vegetables, it wouldn't have given us niacin or ascorbic acid. <laughs> Great line. Uh, so uh, you can see he's dealing directly with our, our, our treatment of nature. The, the, the book is incredibly courageous. This is written at the height of the McCarthy era. The Kansi so much suggests Kami, and they're acting like the McCarthyites were afraid Kamis were acting as terrorists. They turn out to be, as you can tell, the good guys. And by the end of the book, it turns out that the reason Kate um, um, separated from him is that she's a Kansi. So is Jack O'Shea. So are a number of other people, and they're all working together to sort of change Mitch's mind and have him come along, which he ultimately does. They then take control of the Venus shot. They do go to Venus, um, despite the fact that it looked like it was this um, uh, consumer fraud. They go to Venus to create a new world, a world that will be more in tune uh, with nature. And that's how, uh, uh, that's how uh, the book ends. But, uh, it's really a uh, wonderfully vivid confrontation with the fragility of nature, with the way that fragility of nature relates to our own industrial society, uh, with the way that desire is being manipulated by that society. I mean, the notion of an advertising, of course, this was the time when the first subliminal advertising scares went around, that the, they might be doing something to your mind that you wouldn't be aware of. But uh, it's, uh, it's beautifully done uh, and uh, really uh, a very effective uh, warning and one that in many different ways and in many different forms in the book really talks a lot about the way we relate to nature, what we've done to it, and what um, the deleterious consequences of that is. And it comes out of our, our consumerist culture. And the point he makes is it's a losing proposition. We're, all, everybody in the book is trying to sell stuff. In the process, we're all getting poorer. We're all living worse lives. We don't, uh, you know, we don't have cars anymore. We don't uh, have um, uh, decent food anymore. Okay, well, um, we're close to the uh, end. So uh, let me just very briefly mention the two other books and why uh, I uh, recommended uh, 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 them to you or inclu included them. So. Stanislas Lem is a Polish writer who writes in French. Uh, he's the author of Solaris. Uh, and maybe some of you have read it, maybe some of you have seen the movie. Uh, Solaris is real literature. It is one of the truly great science fiction books. It is, it is at the level of uh, genuine uh, uh, great literature. I would recommend it to all of you. It's about uh, people landing on a planet who's, uh, that has one intelligent organism on it. It's ocean. Its ocean is a single intelligent organism, but it deals with, as both this book and um, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, deals with the theme of identity and who you are and how, um, what your sense is of uh, relating to the world as a being. Uh, and that's an interesting theme apart from our theme. Uh, Futurological Congress uh, involves a man going to an academic conference. It's presented very satirically. There's a terrorist attack on the conference. He winds up in a sewer. Uh, he then finds that his mind has been translate, uh, transferred into a number of different people, um, and he doesn't know who he is. Then he finds himself in a world wh which seems very lovely and seems very um, um, beautiful and very well organized, except every, you notice everybody's out of breath, everybody's exhausted, till he gets finally to 
a, 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 a scientist who points out to him that the whole world is an illusion caused by something called mass guns and gives him a pill. Um, this is a little bit like Matrix. Um, gives him a pill. He takes the pill and he sees the world as it really is. It's another world of total resource depletion. People are exhausted because they think they're driving around in cars, but really they're holding their hands on an imaginary steering wheel and running through the streets. <laughs> At the very end, he wakes up back in the sewer and realizes that it's all been an illusion, but maybe not. Okay, last, um, uh, do androids dream of electric sheep is the uh, source of Blade Runner. Uh, and uh, many of you probably have seen Blade Runner. And of course, Blade Runner is about identity and about what's, uh, what's a real person and what's not. These androids are so much like real people. And I'm, the main character, the one played by Harrison Ford in the movie, uh, his name is Rick Deckard. His job is to kill them because they're not supposed to have returned to Earth. And of course, he's killing beings that are so much like human beings that the only way you can tell they're not in the book is um, applying a empathy test to them, a very complicated, sophisticated test that will pick up minor uh, variations between the way a human would respond and the way these androids supposedly respond. And so he's hunting androids using, uh, using this test. What's in the book and not in the movie is this desperation to own a real animal. That's his goal in life, to own a real animal. He ultimately um, gets enough money by carrying out these assassinations to buy a goat. And in the, um, in, in the climatic scene, uh, uh, one of the androids, the one he's made love to, and he's uh, involved in, but she's an android, um, goes back to his home and kills his goat, which makes him very sad. He then goes off to Oregon, finds a toad, brings the toad back to his wife as a kind of gesture of reconciliation because they're having problems. Uh, very excited to find this toad. At the end, of course, they look at the toad and they find a little battery uh, door in the bottom of the toad. But what, what he's saying here is something interesting. The, and this is how I'll, I'll, I'll end. The, the main action and the thing that was in the movie is this notion of empathy being crucial to being human and of course raises the question of whether Rick Deckard is really human because of his lack of empathy for these supposedly non-human beings. There's a scene in the book where he actually is accused of being an android himself and begins to wonder whether he is. Because of course, if you have memory implants, this is the same thing as total recall, you can't be sure who you are, right? But what's interesting in the book is the empathy that moves the action is empathy for nature. It's empathy for something real in nature, something that doesn't exist anymore in the world of the book, which is a post-nuclear war, highly urbanized um, uh, world where um, natural you know, scenery has primarily been destroyed. So again, what uh, Dick is getting at here is this notion of our feelings about nature and how our feelings about nature might be crucial to our ability to uh, relate to each other. Okay. See you next week.